We're on our way to see Franklin Graham at the Melbourne Arena. Okay, we made it here. There's already a line starting to form and um, we've been invited into the private reception, so let's head over there. But it doesn't make sense. When you say to a person that you're a sinner, well, you offend them. Well, wait a minute, I'm, I'm a good person. Why would you say I'm a sinner? We're all sinners. When you tell a person that they're a sinners and that their sins separate them from God and all of their good work is, amounts to nothing, well, that offends them. And then when you tell them that God sent his son from heaven to this earth to take our sins and, to sh and he shed his blood on a cross, well, shedding his blood, what, what kind of heathen religion do you believe in? And, you know, so and that offends them. And then when you tell them that he was buried for our sins and he took our sins on the cross and God raised him from the dead. Really? You believe that? Yes, I believe it because it's true. And there's power when you tell a person that, okay? Yes. There's Holy Spirit filled power. He takes that small gospel message and he pierces it into a person's heart. He pierces their hearts. And God used. So at the Billy Graham Association, uh, when my father died, people said, Frank, what are you going to change? I ain't changing nothing. Uh, why change something if it's, if it's not broke? Yeah. We're just going to keep doing the same thing that we've been doing. My son, Will, is going to keep doing the same thing that I've been doing and then what his grandfather has been doing. We're going to keep, keep preaching till Christ comes back. Amen. And I don't know when the Lord's coming back, but wherever I go around the world, there's a sense, a universal sense with the church. It's soon. So we better be at work. And uh, we're going to continue to work here in Australia. Um, we're going to continue to work uh, in many countries around the world. Uh, we still do crusade evangelism, we st like we're doing here. We still uh, use television, radio, internet. Uh, the last 10 years, we've focused a lot on internet evangelism. If you Google the name Jesus, um, I think there's like 30,000 pages that come up. I mean, how are you going to read 30,000 pages? Uh, the Mormons usually get on page one or two. And I thought, how in the world did they do that? They must own the internet or something, I don't know. Found out that Google puts words up for bid, okay? Put them up for bid. And if you bid enough money, you get it for that day. And you can also bid not just on words, but on phrases. Uh huh. Is God real? Really? Okay. Um, does God love me? There's dozens and dozens of combinations of words that we use, and we own them for that day. And we've built a, a landing page where if a person clicks on, it goes to one of our landing pages where the gospel is presented to the person. And we can go into countries that you might get your head cut off. Uh, places like Saudi Arabia. We have people get saved and communicate to us over the internet. It goes right over the boundaries, right over walls, places like Iran, uh, many, not only just Muslim countries, but uh, countries where it's still very difficult to preach the gospel. The internet gives us access. So about every two, I think it's like two and a half minutes, somebody is being saved on the internet through the Billy Graham Association somewhere in the world. Now, we, the computer keeps the statistics, okay? I mean, we know this. More people have come to faith in the last 10 years than the previous 70 years of my father's ministry. Um, it's, it's, the numbers are incredible. And so we spend a lot of time, a lot of effort in developing how to communicate the gospel over the internet. Now, does the internet have a lot of garbage on it? You betcha. But we can still use it for God's glory. The devil uses it. Let's use it. Let's just be smarter. And uh, it, it works. But we, that doesn't replace preaching. It doesn't replace what we're going to do here tonight. I love this city. My father loved it. He was here 
I think he preached for four weeks in 1959. And I don't, he must have run out of sermons. I don't know how he did it. Uh, but I want to just ask you all a question tonight. There may be some of you here tonight that you think that God cannot forgive you because of things that you have done, uh, sins you've committed, uh, people that you've hurt. Um, maybe you have cheated on your wife or your husband. Um, maybe people that you have lied to, your family. Uh, whatever the case may be, you just feel that there's nothing uh, that can rid you of this guilt and this sin and that there's just no hope for you. Well, I want you to know, first of all tonight, remember this. If you can't remember anything else, remember this. God loves you. And uh, don't forget that. But we do have a problem with God, and that is sin. Our sins separate us from God. And the Bible tells us that God so loved this world, that He loved you, that He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, from heaven to this earth to take our sins. And that when Jesus Christ went to the cross, and He hung on that cross, and He took our sins to the cross, He died and He shed His blood on that cross for you. And on the third day, God raised His Son to life. Jesus Christ is not dead. He's alive and He's right here tonight in this arena. And if you're here tonight and you feel that uh, you can't be forgiven, that there's no hope for you, well, I've got good news for you. There is hope. And I want to look at a man in the Bible, probably the most hopeless person in the Scripture. If this, this guy was beyond help, he was such a wicked person. I want to look at him. And it's in, I'm going to look at the Old Testament. And it's in 2 uh, Kings, chapter 21, starting in verse 1. And it says that Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king. And he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. His mother' name was Hephzibah. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. He rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed. He raised up altars for Baal and made a wooden image as Ahab king of Israel had done. And he worshiped all the hosts of heaven and he served them. He also built altars in the house of the Lord which the Lord had said in Jerusalem, I'll put my name. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. He also made his sons, or his son, pass through the fire. He practiced soothsaying. He used witchcraft. He consulted spiritists and mediums. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Manasseh came from a good home. His father was king before him. Uh, he was a good man, a godly man, a man that served God. But he dies and his son is now 12 years old and he becomes king. Can you imagine a 12 year old running anything? Um, 12 years old and he becomes the head of, the, head of state. And for some reason, he tries to undo everything that is good, all the good things that his father had done. And let's look at him for a second. He, for a second. he led Israel into idolatry. Now God hates idolatry more than anything else. And this guy, Manasseh, this 12 year old kid, reigns for 55 years and he leads the nation into idolatry, worshiping other gods and turning their back on the one true God. He was immoral. And he led the nation into immorality. He had altars to Baal and Ashtar. And, and the worship, and part of the worship to these false gods were involved in wicked sexual acts that they did and they performed. And the Bible said that we're not to commit adultery. Flee from sexual immorality, the Bible says. All other sins man commits are outside his or her body, but he who sins sexually sins against their own body. Now, sexually transmitted infections are up in Australia. I was looking at that today, and uh, it's alarming rate. It's how, how much this is spread. And you see, God gave sex. God wants us to use sex. Sex is uh, uh, to be enjoyed, but it's to be enjoyed in a 
a marriage relationship between a man and a woman, okay? Yes, sir. Now, that's the way God defines marriage. If you get outside of that, what God intended, you become at risk, okay? And the Bible says if you sin sexually, you sin against your own body. So God is not trying to be some bad guy. He intends sex to be used in a certain way, and that's in marriage, in a marriage relationship. And if you get outside of that and use sex outside of that, He's warning you that you're sinning against your own body. And diseases, which are on the increase, not just here, but all around the world, because people are using sex outside of marriage between a man and a woman. And so there is a price to pay, and God is warning us. He doesn't want that to happen. And so He has rules, and we have to live by those rules. And those rules are for our protection.